Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent, one week from Christmas. As we get ever, ever closer to the Bethlehem, we are rem reminded that this coming Christmas Eve, we have two services, a four o'clock service in which the children will be putting on a pageant. And it's one of those pageants that has a, a narrator that carries most of the, the weight of the story, while whoever shows up can be put into costume. So if you have grandchildren or friends or neighbors that have someone who wants to come and join it, they only have to show up and they will be put in a costume. They can be a shepherd or a, an angel or a wise man or whatever works for them, and they'll be part of the part of the deal. So if you have a family that want to come and join us, they don't have to have uh, have practiced and learned lines. They can be part of it, and it, it's actually quite delightful. So that's at four o'clock, and then at, at uh, ten thirty, the eleven o'clock service. Actually, we're gathering at ten thirty where we'll sing some carols for about half an hour, and then do the eleven o'clock service. Uh, leading up to Christmas Day at, uh, mid at midnight. And then, of course, Christmas Day, we have another service, and it'll be at 10.30, and it'll be a, a Book of Common Prayer service at 10.30 on Christmas Day. And I'm sure there'll be a huge turnout for that. <laughs> so that's just fine. And they say we're two or three are gathered, so we'll have a lovely time with that. Are there any other announcements for this morning? Then let us settle our hearts and minds in preparation for worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, who chose the Virgin Mary, full of grace, to be the mother of our Lord and Savior, now fill us with your grace, that we in all things may embrace your will and with her rejoice in your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We have someone doing the uh, lighting of the wreath. I thought we did. Nancy, how would you like to help me? Today we light the fourth candle of the Advent wreath, the candle remaining, reminding us of God's gift of love. Before we do that, let us remember the gifts God symbolized in the other candles of the wreath, lighting the gift of hope, the, the light of peace, and the light of joy. Can you reach? There you go. Come back a bit. Come back a bit. You're, you're almost there. There we go. <laughs> it's not helping. How are we doing? There, oh, almost. Joy doesn't want to be lit today. I think the uh, little wick got bent down. You know what, just hold tight. We're going to do this this way. The Christ candle will help us out. <laughs> Here we go. The fourth candle helps us remember that God is love. You got it. The Apostle Paul reminds us that let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, 
Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. And together we say, loving God, we thank you for your gift of love shown to us perfectly in Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to prepare our hearts to receive and live in his love. We ask this in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Thank you. There you go. Good morning. Oh, get a little cough. This is Cody Bear. He's wearing he's wearing a Christmas ornament on his ear. He he would like to grow up to be a Christmas bear, whatever that is. What do you want to be when you grow up? Don't you don't know. About How about you? What do you what, what would you want to be? A dinosaur digger. A dinosaur digger. A dinosaur digger. A dinosaur digger, wow, that's a good job. They go way, way out in the woods and they find, in, uh, into the desert and stuff and they find dinosaur bones. I have a grandson who wants to be a volcano when he grows up. <laughs> a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? Well, no, no matter what you want to be when you grow up, we know that uh, sometimes we don't really know what, what the future brings for people, but. One of the neat things about Jesus when he was born, and we're coming up to Christmas, aren't we, and Jesus' birth, one of the neat things was the angel came to his mom and his dad and told them that he was going to be something very special when he grew up. He was going to be Jesus Christ, and he's going to be our Savior. And that's a very special thing to know about. Some of us don't know what we're going to be when we grow up. I'm not sure what I'm going to be when I grow up either. <laughs> I think we should decide for you. 
I better decide soon because I may not have that many more years to go. We'll have to figure that out. But Cody's going to be a, a Christmas bear, and you're going to be a digger of, of dinosaur bones. And I don't know what you're going to be, but you never know. But we know what Jesus is going to be. So let's say a little prayer about Jesus. Thank you, God, for bringing us Jesus, the little baby in the manger who is going to grow up to be our Savior. We appreciate him being in our lives and in our hearts at all times. Thank you again, Jesus. God, we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up and helping me. Listen now to the word of God as it comes to us from the reading of Holy Scripture. First reading is from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 to 16. The Lord spoke to has saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shield or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you, to, for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Psalm 80, the refrain is, Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Messiah. Stir up your strength and come to us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowl, <clears throat> bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh at us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made strong for yourself, and so will never turn away from you. Give us life, that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, go Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. The second reading is just the salutation of Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul, 
a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we had received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, 
which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, you are a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Light our hearts, Lord, with your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you take a careful look at today's scripture, you might see that in one way, it's really all about identity and choices. The identity of G Joseph, the identity of Mary, and most importantly, of course, the identity of the child born in the manger in Bethlehem, and the choice that Joseph was going to make. In today's world, we often think of ourselves as being individuals first. Our identity is very personal. It hasn't always been that way. When I first got engaged to my uh, wife back in 1970, uh, the third generation Victorian, uh, who was a third gen generation Victorian, her father called me into the living room. Knowing I'd recently arrived from Baltimore, he sat me down and said, Eric, you're not from Victoria. I nodded my head. He said, you're not from British Columbia. That's true, sir. You're not from Canada. That's true, sir. He said, by virtue of your wife-to-be, your children may well be Victorians, but you never will be. <laughs> to him, identity was where you were from. Who your ancestors were really mattered a lot to him. In ancient Israel, in the same way, one's name and one's lineage were also very important. And so Matthew takes a great deal of pain to tell us the family tree of Jesus leading us all the way back to King David and through him all the way back to Abraham and God's covenant with his people. He points us to the Isaiah passage we heard today where God decrees that a child will be born to the house of David and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Paul also reminds his readers in Rome that Jesus was of the Davidic line, making sure people understood that by this lineage, Jesus met the expectations and prophecies about the Messiah. Paul sees himself and his little Roman congregation as being somehow in that long continuum that stretched back to Moses and Joshua and Abraham, all the way down through to Jesus and his followers. Identity was very important to these writers. And in some ways we too, I think, find identity important. I have cousins who are identical twins so identical that for most of their lives, everyone other than their mother called them Ricky Bruce. They were inseparable, in some ways also indistinguishable. But for two years, only Bruce was around because Ricky went off to university in Spain. When he came back, one of my other cousins, who was then about two, came with the rest of the family to the airport to meet Rick and welcome him home. While everybody else was hugging and catching up and so forth, my little two-year-old cousin was looking back and forth between them and said, Mommy, why are there two Uncle Bruce's? He didn't quite understand that they could actually be two different people. An interesting thing about that, of course, is in the two years while he was away, Rick had become engaged to a woman that he'd met in Spain. At the same time, Bruce had become engaged to a woman back home. It was a time before internet and easy air travel, so neither had met or Skyped or anything else with each other, and they didn't know what the other bride-to-be was gonna look like. It was uncanny how similar the two of them were. And of course, there was a dual wedding. The little devil got into them, I think. On the night of the rehearsal, the brothers exchanged places and walked down the aisle with the wrong wife. <laughs> it was the rehearsal. The two brides didn't notice. And nobody else, nobody else noticed except their mother, who was shaking her head, and nobody knew why she was doing that. <laughs> the very clear reminder that bridegrooms are necessary for a wedding, but they're not the main attraction. The brides are. 
I think the same might be said of mother, mothers and fathers. Fathers are necessary, but it's the mothers who, who we venerate. As a father, I'd like to think that fathers bring something to the table, especially in the today's world where fathers often take on full roles with the kids. But over the centuries, it's understandably the motherhood that's most closely associated with babies and children. And it's mothers who are generally seen as the central figure in their little lives. And so it is with the story of Jesus. Joseph is one of the more important minor characters in the Bible. But after we hear more, the, of this morning's gospel story of the angel appearing to him, we hear very little else about him throughout Jesus' life. He takes his family to Egypt, and he's there when, with Mary when Jesus goes missing as a young boy and is finally found in the temple. But other than that, it's Mary we follow, not, Jesus, not Joseph. And ultimately, of course, it's Mary at the cross. I sometimes wonder where Jesus, Joseph was that day. Had he passed away by that time? Or was he just not there? Or maybe his presence just wasn't noticed. But in today's gospel, we hear this and celebrate Matthew's account of Joseph's, Joseph's role in the miraculous birth. For you see, without Joseph, without Joseph as his father, the angel who identifies Joseph, son of David, when she talks to him, Jesus wouldn't have had a continuous lineage all the way back through King David and finally to Abraham. And his birth wouldn't have been the fulfillment of the prophecies, especially Isaiah's prophecy that we read this morning. Matthew is helping us understand who Jesus was by telling us his family history. In addition to providing the important lineage and thereby fulfilling the prophecy, what else do you think we might learn from Matthew's account of Joseph's response to the angel? The prediction in Isaiah 6 about a virgin conceiving, well, actually in the original Hebrew, it says a nubile woman of marriageable age, a young woman, who everybody at that time would have understood to have been a virgin, would conceive and give birth to a child. Unlike Matthew, that prediction in Isaiah 400 years earlier didn't specify the means by which the virgin would become pregnant. Early Jews weren't actually looking for or expecting a miraculous conception, which I think explains the shock that both Joseph in Matthew's account and Mary in the Luke account suffer. Joseph, being a devout Jew, must have assumed Mary got pregnant in the usual way, which led him to decide to do one of two things. He could either have her stoned, as is called for in Leviticus, stoned to death, or he could divorce her. And Joseph, of course, determined to do the second. Even in what must have been a very hurtful situation, he was thinking of Mary and how the community would treat her. It took the words of the angel in his dream to change his mind and go, go ahead and marry her. As an aside, the reason that Joseph had decided to divorce a woman he was only engaged to was because in the cultural reality of that time, engagement was a legally binding contract sort of unlike engagement actually is today, but it was a binding contract. It was the contract. The marriage was just the formality of it. Breaking an engagement was as difficult as having a divorce now and socially unpleasant in the same way. But Joseph was prepared to take that route rather than hold himself out to the community as the injured party and maintain his own standing at Mary's expense. But then Joseph had a dream and here's the angel tell him that Mary's carrying a child that's not due to infidelity, but rather was from the Holy Spirit. Nothing in Joseph's experience could have prepared him for that. Isaiah didn't predict that. He didn't predict a, a virgin birth, and no one expected the Messiah to arrive that way. And certainly, Joseph didn't have any idea that his young wife would be the carrier, the, birth, the mother of Jesus, the Messiah. In the small community in which they lived, everyone knew everybody else's business. If Joseph married a woman who was already pregnant, for the rest of his life, he'd be known as the guy who married a sullied wife. No one in his community knew that Jesus, the baby who was to be born to Mary, would be the Messiah. In fact, right up to his crucifixion, most people weren't sure who he was. Even his disciples had doubt. Certainly, the people of Joseph's village would never have connected the dots. And so he would have been ostracized and ridiculed for the rest of his life, as long as he lived there. And he knew that. 
added to that, I think we need to remember that in the patriarchal culture of the time, the birth of the firstborn son was an important and crucial part of the family line. So Joseph was being asked to give up the right to sire his own firstborn son. Therefore, when he woke up from the dream, he had to make a decision. Would he believe his dream and accept that it was God's messenger telling him that he had to do something that would forever change his life and his identity in the community? Or would he follow the cultural rules and divorce Mary? Imagine for a moment that you have a really difficult decision to face in your life. And one night you dream that an angel tells you you should do something that you know would put you in a terrible social place for the rest of your life. I wonder what you'd do. I think I'd be pretty unlikely to accept that it had been God speaking to me before the dream. I think I'd probably chalk it up to something I ate, sort of like Ebenezer Scrooge does when he's talking with the, the dead Marley. But Joseph takes a deep breath, and knowing his identity in the community would be forever damaged, and he does what God asks him to do. He does what's right. My father was a Joseph kind of a person. Years ago, when he was president of UVic, a public dispute arose about a lecturer who'd been refused tenure. The man in question stated publicly in the press and in public meetings that dad had been arbitrary and had never given any reason for his decision. Many of us who knew my dad told him to speak up and to tell the reason. The man had turned into a public debate and by opening the door, he was opening the door to my dad responding. The decision hadn't been taken lightly. It had been brought forward to him by the chairman of the, of the uh, department and by the dean. And in fact, the man had been given a long written explanation that dealt with the serious breaches he committed. But dad wouldn't speak about it in public. He said that a personnel decision was between the school and the individual. And he wasn't going to breach that man's confidence because it wouldn't have been right. That decision cost him dearly. In the end, it left, left him hanging out in the public eye as the arbitrary authoritarian that he knew he really, in his heart, he knew he wasn't. And ultimately, led to him leaving the university to pursue a different career. But to dad, right was right. And there was no reason to do anything else, even if it would harm him personally. Most of us can act with integrity when the road is clear and the fallout won't be dangerous. But how many of us, do you think, can honestly say that no matter what the cost, we always act in the way God would have us act? That's one of the messages I think we hear in the gospel today. Like Joseph, like my father, even when we know it will cost us dearly, we need to be ready to do what God asks of us. So where does this take us on the fourth Sunday of Advent? Am I suggesting that every dream you have is God speaking to you? Of course not. And remembering that some of the dreams I've had over the years, I'm quite certain God had very little to do with them. But when we're praying, or when we're dreaming, and we hear God whispering to us, encouraging us to do something that we feel might be very hard, something that might be the hardest thing we've ever done, are we willing to sacrifice ourselves to do what we know God would have us do? And it doesn't have to be a life-changing as Joseph's dilemma was. Maybe over the holidays, we'll have a dispute with a family member. And even when we know we're right, and aren't we always the one that's right, even if we know we're right, we hear God telling us that for the health of the family, we should just let it go. Let the other person win the argument even if it makes us look foolish. Or maybe we've made a mistake and no one knows it's us. And it's God telling us we need to admit it, even though it'll be embarrassing and might tarnish our reputation. Or maybe it's something else that we're struggling with. I'd like to think that we'd try to follow Joseph's example and listen to God in our hearts and then encourage, do the right thing. Because I believe identity is still one of the most important aspects of our being. But it's not our standing in the community that I'm talking about. It's our identity as the children of God, as followers of Christ. 
and that living into that identity is more important than the religious rules of our church or the cultural rules of our society. And because I think, well, I know that we have Christ standing next to us, helping us make the right choices, even the tough choices. And Isaiah and Matthew tells us that the little Christ child will be called Emmanuel, which is God is with us. Joseph's story is one of courage and faithfulness. As we travel to the manger this week to see this wondrous thing that God has done to welcome the newborn Prince of Peace, I think we need to ask ourselves whether with that little child's help, like Joseph, we too can be courageous and faithful to the new kingdom that he brings into being. And with God's help, I truly believe we can. Amen. Will you stand as able and join me in saying the Apostles' Creed found on page 189. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you prepare yourself for the prayers of the people? Let us pray. Jesus calls us to watch and pray and to seek God in unlikely places. May God hear these prayers which come from our hearts and give us courage to explore the unlikely places in our lives and our world. Please respond to the petition, God of love, by saying, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into our world as one of us and for coming to us whenever we gather in your name. Keep us alert and watchful through the dark night of this world and give us confidence as we wait for your coming in glory. God of love, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for your church and for all who share in its life and ministry. We pray especially for Linda, our primate, Sydney, our interim national indigenous archbishop, our metropolitan Lynn, our bishop Anna, and our priest in charge, Eric. We pray for St. John the Divine Courtney and St. Andrew Sandwick and their priests, Alistair and Marion. And we pray for the territory of the people and interim bishop, Jane. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Korea. Keep us alert and watchful in support of one another. Guard us from everything false and untrue and shine on us with the light of your holy word. God of love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the people of the world. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the needs of those around us in our communities and in other places across the earth. Keep us alert and watchful as your witnesses and servants. God of love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the nations. Lift the eyes of those in authority to their duty to govern wisely and well for the good of all. Curb all terror and replace it with peace. Keep us alert and watchful to serve you by living lives of service to others on our daily lives. God of love, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, stand by those who wake or watch or weep. Rest those who are weary. 
soothe those who suffer, shield those who are joyful, and come to those we know in particular need, those we hold in our hearts, and those for whom we have been asked to pray. God of love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord Jesus, we do not know the day or the hour that you will come with great power and glory. Keep us always alert and watchful, so we may welcome you with joy and know your presence in our midst during this holy season of Advent as we anticipate the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your wills and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you stand as able? The everlasting peace of the Lord be always with you.
Gracious God, by the power of the Spirit, who sanctified the mother of your Son, make holy all we offer you this day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. The table of bread and wine is now ready. It's a table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It's a table of sharing with the poor with whom Jesus identified. It's a table of communion in the earth which, in which Jesus became incarnate. So come to the table, whether you've been here before or maybe have never been. It's Christ who welcomes you. It's his feast. So come. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, sustainer of the universe. You are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. Glory to you forever and ever. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation. Glory to you forever and ever. But we turn against you and betray your trust, and we turn against one another. Again and again, you call us to return. Through the prophets and sages, you reveal your righteous law. In the fullness of time, you sent your son, born of a woman, to be our savior. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. By his death, he opened to us a way of freedom and peace. Glory to you forever and ever. Therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for sending us Jesus, the Christ, who in the night when he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine. He gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Glory to you forever and ever. Gracious God, we recall the death of your son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim his resurrection and ascension, and we look with expectation for his coming as Lord of all the nations. We who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the spirit now bring you these gifts. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this offering of your church, that we who eat and drink at this holy table may share the divine life of Christ our Lord. Glory to you forever and ever. Pour out your spirit upon the whole earth and make it your new creation. Gather your church together from the ends of the earth 
into your kingdom where peace and justice are revealed, that we with all your people of every language, race, and nation may share the banquet you have promised through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, creator of all. Glory to you forever and ever. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, I promise you prepare a banquet for, your king, for us in your kingdom. Happy are those who are called to the supper of lamb. My brothers and sisters, the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in this sacrament we receive the promise of salvation. May we, like the Virgin Mary, be obedient to your will. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. And would you stand as able? And we say, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And my friends, as you go from this place, go with the blessing of our Father who is everywhere present in your lives. Go with the blessing of his Son, the babe in the manger, the parables, the lessons, the new life that he offers us in his resurrection. Go with the blessing of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice that's inside you, that carries you forward when you have difficult decisions to make, that lifts you up and supports you. And go with my blessing, the blessing of a friend the blessing rooted in our common pilgrimage, the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. And as we go to Bethlehem, go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. See you.